Today, let's dive into a game-changing book that promises to make your life a breeze while boosting your productivity. The book we're focusing on is Getting Things Done, which is all about streamlining your life to achieve more. Time management is the central theme of this book, and it's something most of us are already on board with. The basic idea is that we all have the same 24 hours in a day, but what sets us apart is how effectively we use that time. Some people are running around like headless chickens without achieving much, while others appear laid back but get a lot done because they've optimized their schedules. The book introduces a quadrant system to help you prioritize tasks. Some are critical and need immediate attention, others are important but can wait. Some are distractions that seem urgent but aren't significant. And finally, some tasks don't matter and aren't urgent at all. The last category. Stuff like binge-watching TV shows or endlessly scrolling through social media should be cut down or you risk becoming a drain on society. If you're constantly caught up in tasks that feel urgent but aren't really adding value, like frantically ordering takeout, rushing to book flights, or being everyone's go-to helper. You might seem busy, but you're not really getting anywhere significant. The trick is to offload these tasks. Either delegate them or just do fewer of them. You might pride yourself on tackling high-priority, urgent tasks, but be careful. If you're always in crisis mode, you're setting yourself up for burnout and inevitable mistakes. You've heard the saying, hurry up and mess up, right? Keep that in mind because issues can sneak up on you over time. What about tasks that are important but don't require immediate action? Think self-improvement, planning for the future, mentoring your team, or even spending quality time with family. These tasks are crucial for long-term success and happiness, but aren't pressing. But beware, if you keep putting them off, they'll morph into urgent tasks and add to your stress load. So the basic idea behind what I call old-school time management is simple. Focus on tasks that are important, but not immediately pressing. By doing this, you'll naturally find that urgent and critical tasks will lessen over time. Sounds logical, doesn't it? Yet a lot of people find this approach doesn't work in practice. They know the theory, but struggle to apply it. Say you allocate a couple of hours to brainstorm or plan. Your mind, however, keeps drifting to that urgent meeting later or that lecture you have to give. You're mentally preoccupied, which makes it hard to concentrate on what you originally set out to do. Sound familiar? It's a common problem in both our personal and professional lives. It's like you're mentally absent. You're not multitasking or scattering your attention. You're just not fully present in anything you do. Ancient wisdom from the philosopher Mencius tells us that the pursuit of knowledge is really the pursuit of a calm mind. What does that mean? It means reclaiming your focus, bringing your mind back to where it needs to be. That's the essence of true understanding. Ever wonder why we should learn from infants? Picture a toddler who's just been crying his eyes out, Suddenly, he turns to play with his toys, and he's all smiles. While he's playing, he's not dwelling on why he was crying. He's fully immersed in the present moment. That's the level of focus we should all aspire to have when we're working. So even if you've got a big meeting or presentation looming, it shouldn't impact how well you're able to do your current job. This level of mindfulness isn't just a nice idea. It's a skill that needs to be honed, much like in traditional Chinese philosophy. Take the Chinese philosopher Wang Yangming, for example, who espoused the idea of the unity of knowledge and action. This principle suggests that your mind should be entirely on what you're doing right now. No multitasking, no distractions, just complete focus on one thing at a time. It's a lofty goal and may take years to master fully, 
But the good news is that these ancient teachings have been translated into practical tools we can all use. Think of the book Getting Things Done as the next level in time management, going beyond the urgent and important philosophy found in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. What sets it apart is its focus on managing human emotions like worry, stress, and irritability. So what exactly is GTD? Short for getting things done, it's a widely popular time management method. The book kicks off by presenting an ideal scenario. Imagine being able to navigate your jam-packed days with clarity and ease, handling everything that comes your way effortlessly. While our living standards have risen recently, we find ourselves engulfed in work more than ever, Ever noticed how modern tools, far from making life easier, actually crank up our busyness? Take washing machines. Sure, they wash your clothes, but now you find yourself doing laundry more frequently than before. Convenience like cars and airplanes has a flip side too. Yes, they make travel a breeze, but you find yourself on the road or in the air more often. The irony is, as technology advances, we're not freer, we're just busier. I see this frantic pace everywhere. Everyone seems overwhelmed. Regardless of how efficient people are, they feel the pressure mounting. So, mastering time and life management is crucial. Only then can we maintain a sense of calm and focus. Even in the midst of our chaotic schedules, that's the discipline we need to cultivate. In martial arts like karate, there's a concept known as a mind like still water. Picture a pond. When you throw a stone into it, the water splashes, but it quickly becomes calm again. This metaphor teaches us that our reactions to life's events should be balanced. If the water didn't react at all when the stone was thrown, that would be unnatural, like stifling our emotions. On the flip side, an excessive reaction, like waiter that won't stop splashing, is equally problematic. The beauty of emulating waiter lies in its balanced nature. It reacts when stirred, but returns to a state of calm as soon as the disturbance ends. This teaches us that failing to maintain a balanced emotional response can lead to a loss of control over our actions and reactions. What exactly constitutes an overreaction? Imagine a situation that isn't actually that severe, but you become exceptionally anxious. This anxiety can grip you, making you helpless in that moment. Take, for example, getting disproportionately angry over a minor issue. You're so mad that you can't talk all afternoon, can't eat your dinner, and can't even sleep at night. In such cases, your emotions end up taking control over you. On the flip side, there's underreacting. This happens when you should have taken care of a situation much earlier. By putting it off due to laziness or procrastination, the issue can escalate and eventually control you. The takeaway is essential. Any situation that prompts you to either overreact or underreact can gain power over you. So if you're unable to handle your emails, work tasks or relationships with your family and superiors effectively, you could end up facing consequences far worse than you initially thought. A lot of people either obsess over certain matters or completely ignore them, indicating their inability to achieve a state of mental equilibrium or mind like still water. So striking the right balance is vital. But how can we reach this zen-like state? In his 20-plus years of coaching, the author noticed a common thread. People are often stressed and tormented due to poor management of their commitments and responsibilities. Learning to get a handle on lingering unresolved issues can notably lessen this stress. What does unresolved mean in this context? These are issues that consistently nag at your consciousness, leaving you unsettled. The true source of our distress might not be the particular problem at hand, 
but the silent pressure that accumulates when we leave something unattended. This unfinished business constantly consumes a part of your mental bandwidth, making you ponder about why you haven't tackled it yet. Such procrastination can adversely affect your current tasks, making them less effective and potentially derailing them. The author recommends a technique involving a work basket, a container where you store tasks you need to take care of. The idea is to forget about them once they're in the basket. Later, you go through this basket, tackling each task one by one. It's a way to ensure that you are entirely focused when you're working on a specific item. I've updated this approach to better suit our modern age, given that smartphones are ubiquitous nowadays. Most of us have a calendar app on our phones where we can list upcoming tasks. So, for example, if you have a meeting set for next Tuesday afternoon, just jot it down in your digital calendar. But don't stop there. Make sure you also block off some time beforehand to prepare for that meeting. Sometimes using old-school time management methods can leave you feeling distracted. You jot down a task, but part of your mind is still worrying about when to prepare for it. To streamline this process, allocate specific times for both the task and its preparation in your smartphone calendar. Let's say you have a negotiation next Tuesday from 2 to 4 p.m. You also schedule prep time for Monday from 10 a.m. to noon. Then forget about it. Your smartphone calendar keeps track of the prep time for each task so you can fully rely on it. The task becomes a non-issue until it's time to deal with it. When the scheduled prep time arrives, you can give it your full attention without stress or distraction using this GTD, Getting Things Done, approach to manage your work and life will make you feel significantly more at ease and focused, preventing external distractions from throwing you off course. This book offers a range of strategies to improve work performance, introducing the idea of bottom-up action management. Instead of starting with lofty organizational or personal goals, this approach recommends focusing on the immediate, smaller tasks at hand. The author illustrates this with a quirky example. Imagine swimming in oversized trunks that are likely to fall off as soon as you hit the water. Staring at your end goal in the distance won't help you here. You have to hold up your trunks first. The lesson is clear. Tackle immediate, manageable issues first. Only then can you genuinely devote yourself to achieving your long-term goals. A key technique in action management is to declutter your mind. The goal is to act more on intuition and less on overthinking each task's specifics. You don't want to waste time mentally revisiting the same task over and over. Think of your brain as the CPU of a computer, while external tools like your smartphone or planner act as the memory storage. In computing terms, the CPU doesn't store data. It retrieves it from the memory, processes it, and sends it back. So, streamline your thought process by offloading tasks to these external tools. Whether you're old school and love jotting things down in planners or prefer using the latest smartphone apps, the choice is yours. The point is to free up mental space for more intuitive action. Offload your tasks to external tools like a physical organizer or smartphone app. That way, your mind can focus entirely on the task at hand. Retrieve a task, complete it and move on. Repeatedly mulling over the same issue doesn't help you make any progress. That's the essence of a bottom-up approach to task management. Also, set up a workspace that you'll love to be in. Maybe it's a well-organized desk. Deck it out with your favorite books and equip it with a reliable laptop. Create an environment that not only facilitates productivity, but also brings you joy. Create a specific cue to jumpstart your workflow. An idea presented in the book, Switch, How to Change Things, 
when change is hard. What's the upside? The moment you sit at your personalized workspace, you'll find it much easier to get into the zone. Whether you're writing, typing, or even drawing, a well-curated environment helps you dive right in. So just like artists need a specialized studio space, you too should have a dedicated office desk. In terms of this workspace, it's best to keep it personal. Even if it's tempting to share a desk at home with your spouse or partner, resist the urge. The moment you find the desk occupied when you're ready to dig in, you'll likely procrastinate and lose your productivity window. You should also consider setting up a portable office, especially as we find ourselves in transit more often, whether it's at the airport or the train station. During these idle moments, seize the opportunity to catch up on work or read. I can tell you from experience that I do a lot of my book reading on flights. The quiet atmosphere, minimal social interactions and lack of phone distractions make it ideal for focus. Instead of flipping through uninspiring in-flight magazines, use the time to dive into a book. In fact, whenever I travel, I pack two books, one for the outbound flight and another for the return journey. It's a simple strategy to maximize reading efficiency, and you could employ the same tactic on high-speed trains. Honestly, I think they should block phone signals to boost our productivity levels. If you're more of a laptop person, that works too. Simply open it up and dive into your tasks. Remember, your workspace, be it stationary or mobile, should be designed for peak productivity. Equip it with essentials like trays, blank sheets, folders, planners, and even a stapler and trash bin. Having these at your disposal ensures you're set for success. In the phase where you gather tasks and priorities, don't just focus on your professional obligations like meetings, discussions with colleagues, or contracts that need signing. Believe it or not, it's often the personal issues that throw you off course. Maybe it's your son's schoolyard scuffle or your spouse's repeated reminder to buy new furniture. These personal matters might seem trivial, but they can scatter your focus and create emotional stress. Remember, these personal issues are as much a part of your life as your work is. Being bothered by them isn't the way to go. Often these tasks take less time than you imagine. But putting them off can strain relationships and add unnecessary tension. So, use the same system to collect these personal tasks as you would for work-related items. The idea is to gather everything that demands your attention, whether big or small, urgent or not. Once you've collected these tasks, store them somewhere other than your head, be it a physical or digital note-taking system, voice recorder, or even your email. Choose a method that works for you and stick with it. Make sure to limit the number of tasks in your designated collection space to a manageable amount and regularly declutter it. Don't let the pile grow out of control. Keep reducing it by consistently addressing tasks and making room for new ones. When collecting tasks, Pay attention to your physical surroundings too. Scan your office environment, starting from your desk all the way to your cabinets. A clean space is a productive space, so avoid unnecessary clutter. On the mental side, if tasks are stuck in your head, jot them down on paper to clear your mind. A good practice is to allocate one sheet of paper for each task. That way, after you've finished a task, you can note down how you tackled it right on the same sheet, either keeping it for future reference or discarding it. This methodical approach to jotting down each task on its own sheet or saving it digitally on your device ensures that your task collection is organized and complete. Next up is the processing phase, where the aim is to empty your work basket incrementally. This fussy requires you to sift through the pile of tasks and issues you've accumulated, but it doesn't mean you have to complete them all. 
Some may require delegating or rescheduling. However, you must address them in some way. The processing phase has a couple of ground rules. First, tackle the most urgent items at the top of your pile. Say your spouse is nagging you about buying furniture. Act on it right away. A quick call or an Amazon order can usually resolve such urgent tasks. Second, focus on one task at a time. We're often guilty of starting a task and then setting it aside, only to do the same with another task. This cycle not only leads to a backlog of half-done tasks, but also wastes time when you need to restart them. So, make it a point to fully complete each task before moving on to the next. This ensures that your work basket remains a dynamic, flowing process, not a stagnant pool of forgotten tasks. The final rule is never to put anything back in the work basket once it's been taken out. You'll sometimes face a situation where you're uncertain about the next steps. When this happens, you have a few choices. Execute the task immediately if you uh, can, delegate it if possible, or put it off for later if absolutely necessary. When you do decide to postpone, it's crucial to note this in your work basket, marking it as a task to be revisited. This avoids it getting lost in the shuffle. Lastly, it's worth noting that some items in your work basket don't require any immediate action. These could be items you'll discard as irrelevant, issues you can't address until a later time, maybe even years down the line, or simply material that serves as a reference. Make these distinctions to keep your work basket clean and manageable, thereby making the work process more efficient and less stressful. Picture this. A work basket chock full of tasks, big and small. As you knock off each task, file away the paperwork, or delegate the responsibility, the basket empties and you're left feeling incredibly productive by day's end. When it comes to getting organized, lists are your best friend. The author recommends classifying tasks into seven key categories. Active projects supportive material for these projects, calendar-bound actions, immediate next steps, items on hold, reference materials, and long-term possibilities. Keeping these categories separate and distinct is vital for maintaining order. But sorting tasks isn't the end of it. Using checklists can add another layer of organization, helping you keep tabs on possible hiccups in your projects events, hobbies, or other responsibilities. In a corporate or team setting, internal consultations usually culminate in a detailed checklist. This is no mere to-do list, but serves as a roadmap for training newcomers and guiding future projects. But organizational tasks are more intricate than individual ones. If you're at the helm of a team or an organization, it's all about synchronized advancement, and for that, you have seven kinds of tasks to manage. Nail those, and you'll steer the whole group towards continuous progress. Take, for example, the book What to Ask the Person in the Mirror, which digs deep into the concept of leadership. One key takeaway is that a shared vision is just the starting point. What comes next are key objectives. Every team member must know their role's crucial objectives and how pushing those forward will achieve key performance indicators. In this context, the idea of organizational management dovetails perfectly with the notion of key objectives. The author here goes beyond individual tasks, delving into the realm of project management. This involves sorting through different types of project-related information. To truly manage your time well, it's crucial to cultivate a habit of regular check-ins and reviews. Only by doing this can you guarantee your approach is effective. After wrapping up a specific stage, there are two main points to think about. First, you have to determine what to focus on in your reviews and when to schedule them. Secondly, Decide how often these reviews should happen. 
In terms of what to focus on, there are generally three areas to consider. Start with your calendar, then move on to your task list or other context-relevant items you choose to review. Make it a point to do this at least once a week, especially for pending tasks. This helps you stay focused on your primary tasks and goals amid the daily chaos. It means taking a moment each week to assess whether you're making progress on your vital objectives. This is the eternal headache for teams and organizations. When dealing with a task, it's crucial to have a multi-layered approach, considering both immediate and long-term aspects. Imagine you're organizing a closet of swimwear. You've got to get that sorted before you can focus on larger objectives. There are six levels to think about. First, handle the immediate tasks at hand. Next, ponder the goals of your current project, then assess your responsibilities. And finally, consider your short-term and long-term goals, wrapping up with your life's ambitions. As you take steps forward, these six levels should guide your actions. Prioritize immediate needs, take ownership of your responsibilities, and plan for your short-term and long-term future. This sets a foundational framework for decision-making and task prioritization. Generally, when a challenge arises, your mind naturally starts working on possible solutions. In essence, everyone has a built-in problem-solving mechanism in their brain, triggered whenever an issue arises. The author sums it up by saying that whether you tackle a problem consciously or unconsciously, most people will experience a five-step process in their thought patterns. The first step in the problem-solving process is to clearly define your goals and guiding principles for the task at hand. The second step is to visualize what success would look like. The third step is brainstorming, where you explore all the possible approaches. The fourth step is about organizing these ideas, and the final step is determining the next course of action. While it may seem like we jump directly to action, we're actually mentally racing through these earlier stages. This makes the brainstorming stage particularly crucial. Investing more time in brainstorming can lead to better, more informed decisions down the line. So, what's the best way to brainstorm? The key is to let your thoughts flow freely without immediate judgment or critique. Write down every idea that comes to mind, no matter how outlandish it may seem. If you're brainstorming in a group, encourage open dialogue. Holding off on critiques and discussions until later ensures that you get the most out of the brainstorming process. By allowing everyone to freely list all their ideas, you're sure to accumulate a treasure trove of potential solutions. Many meetings end up being fruitless and time-consuming simply because people are quick to shoot down each other's ideas. This stifles creativity and can lead to endless debates over a single concept. So, the most effective approach is to simply list out all ideas as they come to mind. When brainstorming, focus on volume. The more ideas you generate, the more well-rounded your thinking will be. Once you've got a good list, that's when you can organize and evaluate to find the best approach. This essentially outlines a solid framework for problem solving. For everyday life management using this technique, it's vital to get into the habit of collecting thoughts and ideas. I've seen my wife excel at this. She keeps a small notebook to jot down anything that happens during her day, ensuring those tasks will be dealt with later. Verbal commitments alone often lead to forgotten obligations, something I've personally experienced. That's why I now rely on my smartphone to keep track of tasks and set reminders, making sure nothing falls through the cracks. It's a fascinating insight that the smarter you are, the more you tend to procrastinate. I've seen this firsthand with a highly intelligent friend of mine. He consistently delays tasks because his brilliant mind can visualize all the potential pitfalls 
and negative outcomes of each task, making him anxious and ultimately leading him to procrastinate. Some experts say that procrastination is a byproduct of perfectionism. Your quick thinking brain can foresee all the difficulties and potential failures, making you hesitant to take on the task for fear of criticism, so you put things off until the last possible moment as a built-in excuse. In essence, the root cause of many people's procrastination is the need for a safety net or an excuse. They'll say, it's not that I can't do it well, it's just that I only had two days to finish it. But why wait until the last two days to begin? This is especially true for many women who claim to suffer from severe procrastination, but make no effort to change. Why? because they're not brave enough to face the potential backlash that could come from giving their all and still falling short. Is the fear of criticism from others really worth losing your peace of mind over? Once you realize that you're not the center of everyone's universe, it becomes easier to let go of that fear. Often so-called intelligent people are their own worst enemies, letting their complicated thoughts affect their efficiency. There's a book from Japan called The Power of Insensitivity that delves into why simple-minded individuals like Forrest Gump seem to get things done more efficiently. When Gump decides he wants to start a shrimp boat, he goes ahead and does it without worrying about potential failures or setbacks. A simpler mind often translates into stronger execution skills because there's less internal debate and conflict. This reduces major time-wasting and highlights the importance of learning to live simply. Today's book, Getting Things Done, gives you a practical approach for organizing your thoughts, much like how a computer uses its CPU and memory. It's a method to declutter your mind from unnecessary stress, worries and fears by noting them down on your phone scheduling them, or putting them in a work basket. Despite its slim volume, the impact it had on my own time management was significant. My takeaway is the importance of focusing on one thing at a time. If I'm summarizing a book or interpreting a topic, I make sure to allocate time to finish it in one sitting, then move on to the next task. This is where I see a spike in my productivity. If you split a task over multiple days, you risk losing your initial train of thought, lowering your efficiency. It's vital to cultivate a focused, calm mind for optimal performance. The book's author concludes by emphasizing the importance of outcome-oriented thinking for effective time management. Focusing on the end goal isn't just motivational jargon. It's a critical skill in your daily life. For instance, if you have tasks to do and your ultimate aim is to make more time for family, specifically to spend time with your daughter, that positive expectation serves as a driving force. It's not just about ticking off to-dos, it's about having a meaningful objective. When that goal is clearly articulated, you're compelled to figure out your next actionable step, making your work all the more purposeful. People prone to procrastination often come to me for advice, and I usually turn the question back on them. Are you committed to changing? If the answer is yes, then the next step is to vividly imagine what that change would look like for you. A clear vision serves as a built-in motivator. Lack of action often stems from indecision, either not knowing what we want or being unsure if we want it at all, once you get clarity on your desires and goals, the choices you need to make become self-evident, making time management far more straightforward. So, to recap, the essence of getting things done is simple. Concentrate on one task at a time. To achieve this, clear your mind of distractions by noting them elsewhere, leaving you focused and efficient.